if you repeat the Gita Dhyanam together. Om. O Bhagavad Gita, by which Arjuna was illumined by Lord Krishna himself, and which was composed of 18 chapters from within the Mahabharata by the ancient sage Vyasa. O Divine Mother, destroyer of rebirth, who showers the nectar of oneness upon us, O Bhagavad Gita, my affectionate mother, on thee I meditate. All the Upanishads are the cows. The milker is the cowherd boy Krishna. Arjuna is the calf. And people of purified intellect are the drinkers. The milk is the supreme nectar of the Gita. My salutations to the Lord, who is the source of supreme bliss, whose grace makes the mute eloquent and the crippled cross mountains. Adiyom Tatsan. Okay. So we pick up. The discussion has been um, started with the question about renunciation, 18th chapter. So renunciation of, and this was Arjuna's question, what to renounce? The question was what to renounce. Um, and that he asked specifically about two types of renunciation, renunciation of action, that is self-centered, and uh, renunciation of the fruit. And so this discussion has come from this. Um, led us to Lord Krishna helping us to see what is action and who is acting. And what's the role of the individual, the ego. Uh, ego is, is the feeling that I'm an individual. Mm. So what is the role of the ego self in this? Which is what? What instigator, name? Instigator agent, yeah. agent, yeah. instigator. Yeah, very good. Uh, so, as it were, it will choose the course of the action mm -hmm. uh, and set it in process. But then the action itself, not I, not from the little I standpoint, right? Uh, and then um, we started a discussion on action itself and. The relationship of action and knowledge. And um, there we go. So this is 1817, 16, 17. Um, and we have the concept of the known, the knower, and the process of knowing, knowing itself, or what is known, or what is to be known. We could say like this. So there are these apparent three. Um, there's I, you, and how do I get to know you? So the process of knowing itself. Um, what do you require in order to know? It's there. Sorry? What do you require in order to know? Oh, No, 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 it's okay. You just relax for a moment and breathe. Okay. It's, it's right there in what we were just talking about. What's required in order to know? Do you need a thing to know? Ah. So the, the process we just talked about, what's required to know? An object. An object is required to know. So because you can't actually know yourself, It says, know thyself, but an object is required. For an object mind. is required for the mind, because we're talking about the, in order to know, that's a mental process, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> is that like when I can know or it's got Well, it's any object. You pick any object. Uh, you see, the process of knowing will be the same. I get to know that object. So uh, you can say you meditate on the object. It's fine. Uh, an apple. How do you meditate on an apple? At what point will you taste it? <laughs> That's meditation upon an apple, right? Uh, 
So you get to know it. What's required is an object. Uh, okay. It's okay. It's a, that point wants, wants to be made. Um, uh, I think Hari's on. I heard him. So. Oh. Okay. So now that leads us into, and here was the, um, here was the sutra, just. Two things. Um, knowledge, the knowable and the knower. So what can be known and the knower form the threefold impulse to action. The organ, the action and the agent form the threefold basis of action. So those are the two aspects of, of action. Uh, and again, it starts with the renunciation of what, with the discussion of what to renounce. We can say action, but there's this discussion that started on what is action and who is acting. And this is essential. It, this is essential. For freedom, there wants to be an understanding of this. Um, so knowledge, the knowable, and the knower. So we used the example of an apple. What can be known, what is knowable about an apple? You, you can go on, it's fine. There's no mistake here. What is, no, very good, what else? So someone else. The texture, very good, what else? Sorry? The, something related to the taste of it can be known. Okay, what else? Where it comes from. Yeah, okay, an apple tree. So all of this is knowable, right? Okay, and what's the object being known? The apple. Apple, and who's knowing it? Me. Me. Okay, very good. Now you've got it. Ah, uh, so do you see that that's the root of action? The object. Knowing. This is the point being made. The desire to know. And with the desire to know... Is the process of knowing. And what are the other two requirements besides the process of knowing? Uh, I and you. the object. Okay, very good. And so once you start the process, that's action. And where does the action start? In the mind. Okay, very good. Huh. You so you've got it. With the knowing is getting more and more opinions than just yourself. So yeah, that's all the, that's all the knowable and the process of knowing, right? Oh, okay, very good. And by the way, at what point do you get lost and it's not about an apple anymore? Oh. And so you see it can go on forever. <laughs> because if the apple leads you to the tree and the tree leads you to the seed and the, then, uh, oh, the leaves and oh my God, Okay, the action and the agent form the threefold basis. The organ, the action, and the agent form the threefold basis of action. So the basis, what's the basis of the action? What's basis mean? Sorry. The underlier. Yeah, the, uh, the basis. Uh. Okay, so the organ, the action, and the agent form the threefold basis of action. Um, so in the case of, of the apple, What's the organ? Eyes. Eyes and mind. Uh, what's the action? Seeing. Yeah. Contemplating all of this, yes? Tasting, eating, chewing, yeah. calling the taste of sense in. Is that the action? Yes. Of knowing? That's what's being done? An agent. What are you doing it for? Who are you doing it for? Who's the agent? Ego. Ego. Ah. Ego. Ego sense. Or not. <laughs> um, no, why, why to do it? Because I am hungry. <laughs> yeah. Who's hungry? Nature. <laughs> it's just mine. God bless you. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, very good. The mind is hungry. <laughs> and why is it hungry? It wants to, it is experiencing that it is. It has the idea that it is. It's separate. Separate. Ah, and it's needing to come into? Union. Union. <laughs> Oh, okay, enough of that. So we move on. Um, knowledge, action, and actor declared in the science of the guna to be of three kinds only. And so this now we step into what are the three kinds of knowledge, what are the three kinds of action, and what are the three kinds of actor? So coming back to the gunas. Ah. So first... Um, knowledge, three kinds of knowledge. So the three kinds of knowledge would be what knowledge, what knowledge, and what knowledge. Just the, just the word, the guna that we're looking for. Rajasic. Exactly. Tamasic knowledge, rajasic knowledge, and sattvic knowledge. Very good. So he starts with sattvic knowledge. That by which one sees the one indestructible reality in all beings not separate in all the separate beings, know thou that knowledge to be sattvic. But the knowledge which sees in all beings various entities of distinct kinds as different from one another, know that knowledge to be rajasic. Yes? But that which clings to one single effect as if it were the whole, without reason, without foundation in truth, and trivial, that is declared to be tamasic knowledge. Tamasic knowledge. Uh, um, we have a very interesting situation in, in, in the world, which is everybody thinks that they know what the world is. Everybody has a perception of what is the world. In the mind. It's in the mind, of course, but but in each person's mind, there's an idea of what is the world, right? Um, and we may have it thought out to a lesser or greater extent. So Bill is a terrible person, but Mike is great. He's my best friend. And pizza is good and, and whatever is bad. So that's part of our world, right? Uh, and so interesting that, and we discover this, that actually the ones who study the world, scientists and the, and the sages or the yogis, um, we study from two different places. The scientists study the outer, the objective reality, and the yogi studies the inner, the mental projection, and then the inner reality, right? Um, we discover, both discover, the scientists discover and the yogi discovers that actually the thoughts that we had about the world were all what? Wrong. Wrong. Regardless of which way we go about it. So what that means is most of us hold on to the limited notions, whether they're rajasic or tamasic, right? Oh. Rama, um, do you just start saying you remember what day is Saturday or Sunday? And yes. he mentioned in one of the books that he read how it was like a questionnaire to the master, and one of the people there was asking, uh, if, you, if you say change in the world starts with him, then since you are a master in life or a master now, what why is the world the same? It hasn't changed a thing. And he said, Well, my world completely entirely changed your world, didn't it? And yeah, said, you know, there you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um okay. So um so starting with knowledge as the as as the the cause of action, as it will, as it will. Then he starts with these three three types of knowledge. Um, 
Swami Venkateshananda adds this commentary. He says, this doctrine can be applied to religion, speculative philosophy, sociology, hum human relations, and ethics generally, or science. One can meditate upon these three verses and derive a wealth of meaning and inspiration from them. Since the ultimate reality is one, the wise man, the sattvic person, sees the one reality in all. The perception um, of the all being the inevitable consequence of the perceiver's limitation as an individual. So each individual, as it were, still has a limitation. So, so if you compare notes even between um, saints or sages, you might find that they would describe the one ultimate reality differently. But they would all see the same ultimate reality in everything. They might describe it differently. They might use a different name, for example, for it. Um, so still the limited instrument relates to the infinite in a limited way. So one will say it's Divine Mother. Another will say it's Shiva. And it, and it may not even just be the name. It may be the qualities which are seen differently, but ultimately the reality is one. Hmm. So he says, he's one in reality in all, but the perception of the all, how we perceive the all, the inevitable consequence of the perceiver's limitation as the individual. The eyes have neither microscopic nor telescopic vision and cannot therefore perceive the grand unity. The eyes can't perceive it. Um, the intellect can finally, can finally relate to it, but the senses can't perceive it. Even if that were possible, there would still exist the distinction between the perceiver and the perceived unity. The sattvika knower, however, intuitively feels the unity that underlies the diversity. So, what's he sharing? He's actually sharing something related to the experience that you had this morning with what you called a crow. So... The ultimate reality would be described differently. But the one who knows that there is the one ultimate reality in all, the mind is in stasis. It's not seeing any longer difference between one and another. It sees the qualities expressed differently. It sees the colors but it's not seeing the reality as other than one overarching reality. The mind itself is seeing. We call it enlightened mind. We call it the Buddha mind or the, or the Buddhi, the enlightened intellect. So, and equanimity, equanimity. So it's a way of the mind relating, but what does that mean? But what does that do? And you know the answer, at least I know that you know the answer. What does that do? When the mind is in equanimity, and you know the answer too, what does that do? You're in harmony and oneness. Yeah. And therefore, the inner, the inner experience, not the mental experience, but the inner experience is the intuitive self. So the feelings of separation and such fall away in terms of the inner experience. And also one is said to be in the Tao or the flow. Hmm. Hmm. So he says, the sattvika nor however, in spite of what they might say, he takes this to the inside to try to get a view of that, intuitively feels the unity that underlies the diversity. And Often that's described as the absence of something when we have to talk about it. But to feel in union is actually 
a deeper experience than a mental experience, correct? To actually feel it is not a mental experience, it's not a thought, is it? If you try to describe it, now you're calling thoughts in. But to experience it, to feel it, is not a thought. It's the absence of thought. It's enabled by equanimous mind, balanced mind, mind that's not making images out of something, mind that's not naming something. Yeah, okay. So the point, sattvic knowledge, when the mind is engaged in this sattvic knowledge, which is actually seeing the unity, relating to the unity, the essential unity and all, then it's equanimous. It's out of the way. Regardless of what it's saying or what the doing looks like. You know, in the sometimes we talk about this. Um, the other day, the concept of a of a Baba, Babaji came up and oh, it was our guest who was here talking with us a little bit. Um, a few days ago, she was talking about the Babajis who, who don't, don't operate to any of the societal norms whatsoever. They might not wear any clothes. In India, they might not wear any clothes. They might drink alcohol. They might do all the things that a yogi would never do, except they're yogis. <laughs> because... Their mind has come to the place of seeing that essential unity in all. And, and it just so happens that that mind's particular expression is, is whatever we would say, oh, that's terrible behavior, it'll never be realized that way. But in seeing the essential unity in, the, in this inner realm, in the in the mind stuff, and not being disturbed by anything, not being thrown off by anything, then still that inner experience is the same. The inner experience is the same. This is being described. So really he's talking about yoga here, capital Y, yoga. Um, so when we hear that, that, self-realization or God-realization or, or like this, we're talking about the intuitive flow. Uh, so where the mind has come to a place of stasis. So the mind is the instrument, the instrument of meditation. It's the instrument of meditation. The mind is what you use in order to practice meditation, right? So, and what is meditation? Meditation is single-pointed mind. The practice is to bring the mind to a single point, single object. But when the object is seen everywhere, then that is meditation. It's what we call samadhi. Hmm? Okay, so that's the sattvic knowledge. Does that resonate in some way? Okay, so it's not about what is said or what is done. It's about seeing the one essential unity in all. Um, but also recognizing that it might be seen differently. But if it's seen in all, <laughs> that's okay. Rajasa knowledge confers on this diversity, not an apparent, but a real existence. It enables us to realize that there are others, other paths and so on, and leads us to a live and let live policy. And Tamasa knowledge, so he doesn't, he doesn't denigrate Rajasic knowledge, um, Rajasic knowledge actually opens the door because Rajasic knowledge, Tamasic knowledge is when we're stuck. And this is the way it is and don't tell me anything else. So there's not really an interest in discovery. There's not really an interest in learning about life or learning about the objects and learning. And yes, there's agency in Rajas as well. 
But the agency will give way to renunciation in time. Because eventually you're going to discover enough to recognize, ah, whatever I do, it doesn't bring happiness. So then you'll ask the question, then where is happiness, how to find it? And when you ask it seriously enough, some capital Y yogi will pop up somewhere <laughs> and say, happiness is inside. <laughs> and in order to, to experience the happiness inside, you act in this way for selfless purpose. <laughs> yes? So in that way, rajas will lead to sattva. Tamas, you get stuck mm -hmm. until something kicks you in the butt. <laughs> like a child. <laughs> until something makes us to act. Then we get stuck. <laughs> Tamasic knowledge does not recognize any but its own point of view. It is the frog in the well, he says. It is dogmatic. It is a wonder that people who call themselves knowledgeable assert that there's only one viewpoint. So only this is correct. Everybody else is wrong. He's describing that as being Tamas. Have they actually ascertained that there are no others? How can one assert that his religion or concept of God alone is true till he knows how many religions there are, which is, of course, impossible? Everyone's viewpoint is valid, but especially valid for himself. We should recognize the validity of others' viewpoints and ultimately the one that runs through all. So it's a, that commentary... And this is um, this bookmarks here. If anyone wants to pick that up and read the commentary again sometime during the day, it's um, it's short, but it's quite profound because within it is is some very good discussion on what is yoga and what is the path of evolution. And the path of evolution is tied to knowledge and what it is that we want to know, and also what is our view. Uh, okay. So tomorrow morning we'll pick up at there and talk about action, the kinds of action. Any uh, questions or comments? Oh. When we get to that state of equanimity for most of the time and being sophic, That's when the peace of just knowing that we're all one and, and feeling it and not looking for differences. So, that, so? everyone, come back to um, <clears throat> even though we know the unity um, it, in the world experience we have to treat each object in accordance with its use or its dharma or its or its condition so we can know that the harmonium and the cup are one we can know that not have any feeling of them being separate or different but we can recognize that that and we could say it in a funny way the absolute in this form is for playing and singing and the absolute in this form is for drinking <laughs> without without judgment discernment but no judgment discernment but no judgment so and and um, in terms of the inner experience, it's it's better described. You don't you don't walk around it, as a practice. You can walk around saying, "You and I are one." As a practice, that's a great practice, and seeing the unity. As a practice, you want to practice that. You want to see the unity. You want to see the interconnection. 
That's a practice. So you can repeat it in the mind. You can repeat a mantra. Aham Brahmasmi. You can repeat Tatvamasi. That thou art. These mantras are helpful. Uh, um, to say to yourself in the mind, I and you are one. There is one underlying reality. Uh, to say this is helpful. Yeah. But the experience is not that. The experience is the absence of the feeling of separation. It's just that. It's very simple. It's very simple. It's not a mental experience. It's the absence of the feeling of separation. Then it's described in different ways, but I would say that's a good way to describe it. It's just the absence of that feeling of being incomplete. The absence of the feeling that I have to attain to something. It doesn't mean that that you stop acting. Because why is it that, that the only reason to act is in order for you to attain something? That's a there's a thought there when the when the mind is still under obeisance to the ego. There's a thought which is in order to do, I have to want something. So if I don't want something, why would I do? We've all heard this inside. <laughs> oh, Timothy. Well, but the difficulty is any action, if we think about it long enough, is going to be an ego action. And a renunciation, if we think about it long enough, is also going to be an ego action. It and is, you wind up just, you know, wondering how do you even navigate the world? No, why is that? Why is that so? That's a that's a perception or an idea. Uh, mm -hmm. If you relate to the unity, just I'll give you an example. If you relate to the unity, and you, you see that this form in front of you, this person in front of you, is hungry. Why do you have to act for yourself? Why do you have to have an ego notion in order to get some food and feed them? Because after you do that enough, someone else has to take care of you. You're not the body. You've never been the body. What, does, what has to be taken care of? Then if I am always feeding as I have, you know. But you're not feeding. Nature is feeding. If you see the unity, it, it, I know it sounds weird, but also you have to stretch your mind a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're seeing, imagine that you're seeing the unity. Imagine that you're not identified with this body. Imagine that, that, you, that you don't have the feeling that you need something from anything, from anyone or anything. Just allow that, allow for that. Okay. So now you're placed in a situation where someone in front of you is needful of food. So in, from that place, can you offer food without feeling that you need something in return? Sure. Okay, very good. That's it, that's it. And, and by the way, to not offer the food, if the food is available to not offer the food, why would you not? Uh, but for me, that year after year, eventually I'm not helping the people closer to me. You can't help anyway. You're not doing a darn thing. No, I mean, Other people remember, just no, remember, just come back. Just come back. Just allow for it. Um, it's not about believing everything that's been shared at this point. It's not. But, but we have to have a good, honest discovery process. And, and this life, in a way, it's a science experiment. Because we keep, we keep taking ideas, beliefs, knowledge, and then we live according to it. And we see what happens. And so 
when we get to some of these teachings, there's a there's a practice. It, it, it's said that we learn these higher truths through shravana, manana, nididhyasana, which is listening, contemplating, contemplating them, looking at our own experience, considering them like that, and then living as if they're true. And with all of our ideas, we've always been living as if they're true. With the ego-centered stuff, we've been living as if it's true. So there's a notion, you and I are separate, so I live as if it's true, correct? And we have self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, but, but let's say that's unfulfilling. And I hear that you and I are one. And I ask questions and I discover that, that actually the body is universal, the mind, mental function is universal, the prana is universal, the blood is universal, that every aspect that I considered myself to be is not me. So let's say I learned that through contemplation. Now I'm going to practice it. How do I practice it? I practice it by living as if you and I are one. So instead of doing for me, I do for you, but not as a separate being. As that which is higher. Uh, and so through the process, we'll discover something. But, but here I'm just, and there's a, do we know the term provisional? Provisional means take something as truth until you learn otherwise. Provisional, so it'll tide you over. it'll tide me over. It's like a bridge. Like a bridge, yeah. So you can accept things on a provisional basis when they make sense to you. When you do the inner inquiry and and check and see, and you might have some experiences that will help to support. And then the then the question is because you started with a with a with a proposition, you said. Everything that you would do, every action that you would take, it brings you to the ego notion. And I'm saying, no, it doesn't need to. It doesn't need to. Does that make sense? Because if you actually saw the unity, then interestingly, to not act where there's, where there's someone in need in front of you, just because you see the unity... Do you say to yourself, well, I'm not going to act because this is all the unity and so their suffering is unimportant. It doesn't make any difference. That's ego-centered stuff. That isn't anything I would be saying. Yeah. So, um, so there you go. So in practice, you're, you're closer to the mark anyway. Um, but now you're asking uh, an intellectual question, making an assumption, and I'm just saying actually the assumption is not is not correct. And try it, and you'll see. Mm. <laughs> um, it's possible to act without feeling separate. It's possible to act without wanting something. It's possible to act as an offering, uh, simply as an offering. And it's even possible to act knowing that you're not acting, knowing that you're not the doer. And that way, recognizing the role that you have, which is to call forth the action um, and see what happens. <laughs> really, we're always doing this. I've done this and I've been blessed. Yeah. And I've been blessed and blessed, and I don't know why. Oh. You know, that, know see, that's it. To be yeah. You don't have to deserve to be blessed. You are blessed already. <laughs> you don't have to do something in order to be blessed. You just, you just need to bring yourself into alignment with the universal factors in order to know that you are blessed. Can, can I share something? Please. About 
Tim and just about this too. Like <laughs> my experience, Tim, is that you like let energy of love flow through you. Oh my god, all the yeah. Time. yeah. Like when you're in my presence, I feel like totally loved by you and supported by you. And every time that you visited Jules and I and uh-huh. Stara, and so like that allowing of that like yeah. energetic flow, like just creates like a bigger space. And so like the more space that there is, the more the universe is just gonna like use you. So like let that flow come through and so like i also personal experience is that like so many times things that the, the more that like when i'm when allowing myself to be in that universal flow the Tao, yes. things just come to me that i need that i didn't even have to like go and get it's only what i need of course like it's not more right. i want things they're like yeah. it tends to <laughs> gum up the works yeah. in my experience but like it does you you let that flow just like happen naturally. So just many put your arm down. And so it, it, it just <laughs> the universal mind and we'll my like sort of conception or experience like the energy flows to where the energy is like flowing out of. So it's just like there, like more mm-hmm. flow is created because it's just like that helps support the whole. Well, it's it's, just, it, it, it's intuitive. You don't have to do anything. You yeah. just allow it. Like well, what happened? What happened, by the way, is that is that your mind became one with mantra at some point. You've been chanting mantra for ten years, mm-hmm. and uh, so the mind, the knowledge, becomes sattva. Uh, and so that brings the mind to more and more equanimity, and so the intuitive flow happens now. When you reflect upon it, you might see something differently. But but those that you're around observe that you're acting from the intuitive place, from the from the place of love. Right. Oh, and I, I feel that somehow talking about it is difficult. Yeah, it being is. Being in it, I get that. Right. But being in a room and intellectually talking about the, that is uncomfortable for me somehow. Yes. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Understood. Um, um. So, in, interesting point is this knowing. So, you are already what you sought. You are already what you saw. You are already in union with all. Um, But somehow there's a need to know it. (laughs) And so the mantra practice that you took on is a is a is a practice that that opens this up. Um, but still, there's a need somehow to know it. And even to know something about that, that process. Because that allows you to let go of, of the not knowing. Um, Sean, you had a... Let me ask. Um, so, to see the unity at all, like advanced yogis do... Uh, is that is there a false presumption then that that equates to desirelessness? Meaning that because you see the unity in all this, nothing else to desire, or is it possible that even if you see the unity in all, you still desire things? You want to have certain things. So you've never you've never desired everything, anything because you're soul. You've never desired anything because you are soul. Desire is rooted in ignorance. You're not ignorant. It's some clothing that you got mixed up in. You picked up that that pair of underwear, and now you're going to take it off. (laughs) The the ignorance was not you. Um, um, In fact, it's the Lord's, but the Lord is not ignorant. So just because you see the energy, it doesn't mean you're you're desireless. You're not the body. You're not the mind. You are not the desire. You have always been desireless. Desire only belongs with the person. Mm -hmm. Ah. 
So, and the way to the way to get there, that's just an intellectual state. That's just a statement. It's just a statement. It's just a statement. The way to get to that place of desirelessness is to desire only union with the Lord, only service with the Lord. And so that'll lead you out of it. So there's different perceptions of that. Yeah. Say. Yeah. Okay. Om. Thank you. Om. Om. Um, it's not one is greater than the other. It's yeah, correct. Okay. Correct. That's it. And you just stay with it until that desire is pure. All you want is to serve the Lord. All you want is to be with the Lord. Wow. Okay. Answers so much. Om. Mm -hmm. Om. And that that will lead you to an inner place of non-disturbance. Because like you were saying earlier, you know, we have this expectation well, if they're enlightened, then they should be doing those things, which is a judgment. It's a judgment, yeah. And hence, yeah. And it's just it's just given to us that it's tamasic. Uh. <laughs> Meaning it's dark, darkness, not not fully. Okay. Oh. All right, let's close. Find prayers in RT. Page uh, 174, the short one again. Oh, Om Triambakam Yajame, Surandim Pushti Vardhanam, Morai Rukmiva Bandhanan, Mritor Mumshya Mamritat. Om Triambakam Yajamehe Surandim Pushti Vardhanam Morai Rukhameva Bandhanam Mritor Mukshya Mamritat Om Triambakam Yajamehe Surandim Pushti Vardhanam Morai Rukhameva Bandhanam Mritor Mukshya Mamritat Om Shanti 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 I'm below Sakura Shivan and Rajiki and for all the saints and sages of all the traditions. Yeah. Okay, let's stand for RT.